So good morning, and uh, let's look at suffragettes. Uh, I could say I have to put it in a, a national context, but uh, I could say uh, on this I'll put it in a local context as as well. This first picture here, this is of uh, Dora Fulis uh, from Huddersfield. She was being arrested in 1907 for trying to break into the Houses of Parliament along with other suffragettes. Uh, she was just 17 at the time, was labelled the baby suffragette by the press. And this, her picture appeared on the front page of the Daily Mirror. So that's quite a long way uh, from where I'm going to set off chronologically. I'm going to set off not right back at the beginning of, of time, uh, but perhaps uh, a bit of a preamble uh, coming up to the suffragette movement. So there's an understanding really of, of where it came from. But really, it's over sort of, I guess, centuries uh, that uh, women's role in society have been diminished. They were often seen by men as being mere ornaments uh, to them and only played uh, sometimes a very minor role in society. Except, And they were exempt from government uh, posts, political posts and local posts uh, as well in local government. And they could say they were only required to do a sort of limited, I guess, domestic education. But this didn't stop women actually from working at all because they uh, formed the backbone, really, of the textile industry. We've see, seen them uh, underground in mines as well. Uh, and so they've been used for a variety of skills. And sometimes it's actually, they became the major breadwinners in the family, but they had no right to say in politics, but neither did their husbands, really, unless you ever had a certain income or a certain amount of property. Sorry about that, I just clicked the uh, things. Uh, and uh, But some women never married and they actually inherited large incomes. Uh, and again, they probably found themselves popular as uh, investors. And because they, this gave them uh, sort of financial independence to play, uh, I guess, some type of role in society. Sometimes they, uh, as we've seen before, uh, that they founded arms houses. They put money into schools uh, and into people uh, less well off than themselves. So that's the type of thing uh, that they used to do. Things started to change with the publication of this book in 1792 by Mary Wollstonecroft. Uh, she was born 1759 and died in 1798, uh, aged 38. Uh, both she was born and died in London. And you say this is a vindication of the rights of women. And uh, you say she argues that a women's education ought to match their position in society and should have the same fundamental rights as men. Because they both should talk about the people in society. Uh, they're those people who came from, uh, who had some money behind them as well. And that was quite the, was the view even up into the suffragette uh, times uh, is that it, and as we see as it, as it rolls on, is that the most of the people who were leading the movement were people who had a bit of money behind them or had wealthy husbands. And because they, one of her best friends was a lady called Jane Gardiner. Uh, her father had taught Mary uh, at, uh, and, and they, they lived in, in, well, one time moved to Beverly prior to 1747. Jane uh, was married uh, well, uh, she had been a governess before that time, and opened a school at Elsham Hall, which is in North Lincolnshire, roughly where the M180 and the uh, A15 from Lincoln uh, intersects. So it's about eight miles south uh, of the uh, Humber Bridge there. So that was sort of the sort of the first inkling. Actually, got uh, the book published, which was quite surprising in those days as well. But really, uh, rolling forward to 1832 was the Reform Acts that were uh, brought in, and these specified that it was male persons were allowed to vote uh, due owing to the value of the property they owned, and. Uh, but because of this uh, value of the property, it actually brought a few women into that and they were allowed to vote uh, uh, of this as well. But this was only withdrawn a few years later in 1839, 1835 with the Municipal Corporations Act, which is a bit of an oddity for the uh, women's uh, uh, right to vote, who uh, would uh, uh, gain that on a... Uh, 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 the amount of property that they owned. And uh, because this act was largely about clean water, it was about sewage uh, uh, as well. 
and you could say this is this establishment of the new sort of local boards and, and councils, uh, and they were elected by ratepayers. And this, that was where it came in, is that it specified male ratepayers and excluded females from in there. So all women completely lost the right to vote in 1835. Women straight away started to let their feelings known when they sort of banded with the Chartist demonstrations, uh, which were really men campaigning for the vote and other benefits. Uh, they had a charter uh, they put forward, uh, which they called the Six Points, uh, but in it, it didn't mention women at all. And I say women were probably a bit more buoyed uh, in, in this time because in 1837, Victoria had come to the throne. And I say it probably uh, seems though that women now would be treated seriously with a female monarch on the throne. But perhaps it wasn't because in the 1840s, even the Brontes had to use male pseudonyms to initially get their books published uh, because they thought that they, they wouldn't, although there had been a number of female novelists before their time, which had been very successful. But we see that um, Sheffield was a hotbed of Chartist activity. There were uh, disturbances there on the 11th of January, 1840, uh, what was dubbed a second Newport Rising that had happened earlier uh, down in Wales. It's when the uh, police had charged uh, the crowd and killed a number of people as well. And because there was uh, also rumours of a Sheffield armed plot to take the town hall and other buildings. And on Monday, uh, May the 29th, 1840, in Bradford, a Chartist, uh, a Chartist stronghold as well, up on Adelaide Street, that's uh, just off the Manchester Road. Uh, this was besieged by uh, Chartist. Amazon, as she called uh, uh, Mary Mortimer, I guess because of her mighty power uh, and strength, uh, helped to uh, hold at uh, bay up to 50 police, so it was reported. Uh, and you could say both was a, a supported by uh, special constables and a dragoon of infantry as well. And here we find that women were throwing objects uh, at the uh, from their houses. Mary was pinned to door by a trooper's sabre. She yelled, I'm a Chartist and will die a Chartist as they dragged her away. 18 were arrested for rioting with Mary being the only woman. Uh, and so she and 15 others were tried but were released due to lack of evidence, so they said. So although there were female Chartists like Mary Mortimer, uh, say they were largely sort of supporting the males behind that in order to get male suffrage. Uh, say at this time, really, women didn't uh, want have the aspiration to vote themselves. I guess they thought if they could get their men folk uh, to be able to vote, then that would partially uh, represent them. And maybe in time is that they would get the female vote as well. I guess they've sort of feminist goals at this time included the right to sue an ex-husband after divorce, and that was achieved in 1857, and the right for married women to own property, that was achieved in 1882, uh, after although some concessions had been made by the government in 1870. I'm going to say, unmarried women ratepayers won the right to vote under the Municipal Franchise Act of 1869 and in 1894 was extended to some married women, but only to vote in local elections. So a sort of a very small minority of women were allowed to, to, to vote, but only in sort of very local uh, affairs. And it amounted to really only about a million people across the uh, across Britain at that time. I mentioned uh, Sheffield uh, to, to begin with there, uh, going back in 1840, but really this is, I guess, the very uh, beginnings of the suffragette movement uh, starting uh, in, in that city. Uh, I say in 1842, the Sheffield Complete Suffrage Association was established, uh, which was a, a Chartist organisation that came after that sort of uh, rioting that had happened on there before him. But really, Chartism ran out of steam after 1848, uh, when the third charter, which had proposed to the government, uh, was rebuffed. Uh, and it sort of splintered. The economy was doing quite well at that time as well, because we normally see that uh, uh, this great uh, political upset happens in time when the economy is in a nosedive as high unemployment. But as soon as people are employed, they're sometimes not really bothered about what happens politically until the next bout of unemployment. 
And uh, so we see on uh, the 26th of February, 1851, at the Democratic Temperance Hotel, 33 Queen Street in Sheffield, the very first uh, political female political union was formed. And really, that's the start of the story of British women's struggle uh, to get the vote. That cutting there is the, uh, you could say, the... Uh, the founding of that uh, published in the uh, uh, Sheffield Star uh, of that time, or what later became the Sheffield Star. The first meeting was addressed to the Women of England, Beloved Sisters, uh, that was the association's manifesto was written by its chair. Uh, it is a female list, uh, a buyer Higginbottom, and called on women to shake off our apathy and raise our voices for right and liberty till justice in all fullness is conceded to us. For what is liberty if the claims of women be disregarded? So one of the first things they did was a, a, get a, a petition up for women's suffrage and they submitted it to the House of Lords when they persuaded George uh, Howard, the seventh of Earl, uh, Earl of Carlisle, uh, to take that in. Of course, it is rejected. It's something that will get used to uh, really for the next 50 or 60 years as, as well. Uh, but like I say, it sort of shows that there's a gathering of momentum, uh, especially in, in the Sheffield, South Yorkshire area, for change to happen. But uh, could say we'll see that nothing really did happen. But uh, we can see that uh, there is a, a few women were able to gain uh, sort of public office as well. So really beyond that Sheffield society, but it was sort of a, there wasn't a network uh, or, or an organisation uh, to represent them on a, on a national basis. So this was just really uh, happening down in Sheffield. The first national one was the National Society for Women's Suffrage or the NSWS founded a lot later than the Sheffield uh, Society. This was founded on the 6th of November, 1867 by Manchester-born Lydia Becker. And that's her picture over here. And uh, she uh, was born 1827, died in 1890. So she really sort of had died before the sort of suffragette movement had really started in the early uh, 20th century. I guess I say she died at age 63. She was a biologist, which was quite unusual for that time as well, because very few women, uh, especially trade in sciences or, or any other subject matter for that being. But again, she came from a fairly wealthy family as, as well. And I guess the movement spilled to the other side of the Pennines and to, into Yorkshire, particularly in the Huddersfield and down the Spen Valley. So that's really Batley, sort of a uh, Dewsbury uh, area. And so one celebrated event was when the widowed shop owner, Lily Maxwell, name appeared on the register of voters in Manchester. It wasn't the first case uh, in which this had happened. Largely it happened because is that if she was fairly wealthy, the name would have originally been in the book uh, under her husband. Her husband had died and then her name uh, appeared in there because they had to have a name down for somebody who owned the property. And that's how really by perchance is that she came to be allowed the vote. And so um, is that uh, Lydia Becker encouraged her to take up the vote uh, as her name was on the returning officers list. The returning officer looked down the list and indeed her name was down there and she was actually allowed to vote. However, when the Education Act, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I missed a bit there, uh, I guess a, uh, uh, I guess a, uh, then a case was made for women to vote uh, by Richard Pankhurst. He was a barrister husband of Emmeline Pankhurst. Uh, they married in 1875, 1879, but the case was dis dismissed. Another lady, Alice uh, Scatcherd, uh, born 1842, died 1906, knew Emmeline and uh, Richard Pankhurst and formed uh, the Leeds branch of the National Society for Women's Suffrage that uh, uh, Mrs. Brecker had, Becker had, had established, and that was in 1889. And then we see prior to that in 1873, Catherine Buckton became the first woman in Leeds to hold elected office following that year's school board elections. The school boards uh, were uh, established uh, by uh, under the Act of the Education Act of 1872. 
and uh, they were to establish in some districts uh, if there was a consensus uh, locally that a school board should manage the school. So Leeds uh, would have had a large number of schools, but its outer suburbs, such as where we come from in Horsef, didn't because it was cheaper not to have a school board established. And it was another layer I guess, of government, uh, really. So a lot of places didn't have them, but Leeds did have them. And perhaps uh, she was allowed onto this board because m mostly women were employed in education and I guess they, they were also allowed to stand for these sort of minor uh, local government posts as well. But however, when the Education Act of 1902 uh, was established, uh, that abolished school boards and then transferred to the power to the local councils, which then made women again uh, ineligible for e election even to these local school boards. So keeping on with the 1870s, like I say, in the same year, 1872 of the Education Act, the issue spilled over in Batley. Uh, Lydia Becker, again, wrote to Batley Council asking them to support a pe petition to allow vim women to vote. They uh, made no comment apart from moving on to the next item in the agenda. And that was basically turning a blind eye to all this activity that was going on. And then... Uh, agitation started in Batley, 6th of April, 1872. So just a few weeks after this. So we're, we're making the really the Spen Valley a hotbed to test uh, sort of the, the rights of, of women down there. Largely because it's a heavy woolen industry down there. So most of the women were, would have dominated these mills down, down there uh, as well. And they say a large scale meeting was held down there in the town centre. And uh, Lydia Becker then started to produce a magazine called the Women's Suffrage Journal that was published from 1870 to 1890. I guess they, uh, when she was, was alive, I guess she died in 1890. And this was really the only way that sort of local societies could be kept in touch uh, and will, you know, made people known to one another. Coming further down in, in the Batley Jewsby area again, 1875, there was a woolen weaver's strike down there. And this was led mostly by women as they were gaining, going to get a 10% wage cut. Uh, and in February that year, 9,000 people descended upon Jewsby Town Centre to hear Batley-born Anne Ellis to talk about trade unionism. We don't hear of uh, Anne Ellis, uh, although she was one of the uh, main people in the 1870s, uh, but all we know about her is that she died in Bradford Workhouse in 1919. So uh, down in Batley, this led to a public meeting in the town hall on the 29th of February, 1876. The seats were free unless you wanted to reserve one and then it cost you a, a shilling. Um, like 5p in new money and like a lot of these meetings women weren't on the platform and that was sort of fairly typical right through to the 1890s uh, that might have been uh, produced maybe the majority of the audience but they were never allowed really to speak on the platform these were all the local councillors is that Lydia had written to just a few years earlier uh, where they sort of turned a, a blind eye to, eye to her. But now they find themselves, I guess, in the middle of a political storm down there. And uh, could say that uh, uh, Lydia Becker and Alice Scatcherd both made sure that there are enough women down there to sell it out. Surprisingly, there was no report of what it was said at that meeting at all. Down in Sheffield, the movement was spearheaded by a lady called Jessie Cregan. She was born 1835 and died in 1899. So all these women sort of around uh, and dying before the sort of the uh, movement uh, properly started. And uh, say almost all the uh, other agitators at this time beyond the Spend Valley were people who had a little bit of money, but not uh, Jessie. Uh, this is what writer Henry Hydman saw. Jessie Cregan was ugly self-taught, roughly attired and uncouth in her ways. Yet all this was soon overlooked when once the lady began to speak. She came forward, dumped down on the table in front of me an umbrella, a neck wrapper and a shabby old bag. She, then she turned round to face the audience. She was greeted with boisterous peals of last, laughter. No wonder such a figure of fun you never saw. It was Mrs. Gamp come again in the flesh. Umbrella, corkscrew curls and all. There she stood with a battered bonnet on her straggling grey hair, with a rough shawl pinned over her shoulders. 
displaying a powerful and strongly marked and somewhat bibulous physiognomy with a body of portly development as broad as it was long. In two minutes, the whole audience was listening intently. Within five, she had them in fits of laughter, this time not at her, but with her. A little later, tears were in every eye as she told some terribly touching story of domestic suffering, self-sacrifice and misery. So it went on. This ungainly person was producing more effect than all the rest of the speakers put together. She also travelled uh, with her companion, Tiny the Dog, and taking the argument to workers uh, at the factory gates and also in the streets. In the summer of 1879, Jesse and Tiny, uh, they arrived at the Temperance Hall in Sheffield. That's the place where that sort of first uh, ladies uh, union was, was formed. And according to the Women's Suffrage Journal, she won over more than a few local men with a speech here, including a Mr Cook, who commented that he never thought about women's suffrage, except that it was a good joke till Mrs. C till Miss Cragen came. So that's what was happening in the 1870s. So uh, I guess it was known politically to the two main parties. And uh, unusually, uh, this uh, was one of the reactions to it. And we've mentioned them before, the Primrose League that was established in 1883. Uh, and that only came to uh, an end in 2004. And this was really uh, to, uh, was established by the Conservatives to promote their politics. Uh, and this was through social events and supporting the community. And this was one of the few political organisations that uh, females were able to join and young people as well. I think they're sort of seeing that uh, they would go and do the groundwork, the spade work, and then the men would come in and take over after that. It also potentially gave the right for the classes to mix as well. Again, remember, remember that these political associations were only made up of those people who were able el eligible to vote uh, in them as well. And I can say at that time, it was only men. And so this is why the Primrose League was really established uh, uh, as well. And so they played an important job, but even though they had no bearing on politics at all at the time, they would take people uh, to, be, to be elections. And because they, uh, although it was really uh, run uh, by the Conservatives uh, for, by, by females, it didn't promote women's suffrage as one of its objectives. So we're going to look at other things in the uh, what was happening in the 1880s, because between in this decade, between the census years of 1881 and 1891, uh, women in the workforce rose by 24 percent. You say these were all in low paid, so I guess, sweatshop like conditions. I can say if you see them in London laundries and other things were established like this in, in, in this decade. Uh, there were the burgeoning middle class had their own houses. A lot of people worked as I guess they probably the best paid was well, not say the best paid one. Uh, but an acceptable job would have been as a governess. Uh, and that was sort of, I guess, something that you tried to aim for. Say in 1882, Parliament received its first demands for the women's vote in the petition from the National Society for Women's Suffrage, that's one I mentioned before. It was then uh, led by Elizabeth Wustenham Elmy. She was born in Manchester. 1839 and died in 1918. Didn't really play a major part uh, in the uh, in the movement, uh, considering that she was alive until just at the time end of World War One. Uh, she has a, a local uh, connection, although she was born in Manchester, again, to a, a wealthy family. Uh, she was educated at Full Neck School, uh, the Moravians uh, settlement outside of Pudsey in, in Leeds. Uh, she was a paid employee of the union and uh, lobbied Parliament with regard to laws that were injurious to women and was nicknamed the Scourge of the Commons uh, for, I guess, I think she was a a, a dog that wouldn't let go of a bone. And in 1891, she left and formed the National Society for Women's Suffrage uh, and uh, could say, uh, then uh, seeded from the other union. And uh, could say, we had this reform bill that came in uh, 1884 and there were quite a lot of demonstrations organised uh, to support this. In Sheffield on, on the 27th of February, 1882, at the Albert Hall, that's the now the site of John Lewis, uh, which is 
uh, opposite the city hall where the concerts uh, are held uh, in, in that area, right in the city centre. And that was presided over by Lady Habiton. Uh, she was the founding member of the Rational Dress Society, calling for more practical fashions for women. So a lot of sort of the splinter groups around, and that was really the, the problem. There was no sort of a concerted effort uh, nationally, even though there were a number of national organisations. I'm going to say thousands of women of all classes uh, crammed into the hall. Uh, I'm going to say, although it sort of uh, extended the right to some people uh, to allow them to vote, uh, it still sort of uh, even, because it didn't affect women at all, it even limited the um, amount of men. And it still left 40% of men without the vote, uh, I'm going to say, and no women at all. But really what it did that, uh, I'm going to say, as it passed through the uh, House of, uh, of the Parliament, is that it sort of banded women more closely together than it ever had uh, done before. And this resulted in 1888 with the founding of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, or the NWSS. And uh, say it's, uh, that was formed because uh, people didn't like the old style because uh, there, it wasn't, there weren't political organisations, the NUWSS. Um, was meant to be a political organization that was fighting for rights uh, and because they involved in the trade union movement, whereas some of the others had sort of gone past that, maybe because uh, there were more middle class women who weren't working and there were for this organization was really targeting those people who are working and they, the rights and abuses that they had to suffer at that time. And I uh, say the uh, old leaders, sort of Lydia Brecker, had sort of then sort of fell away from the scene. And I uh, say the um, we also see in 1889 the Women's Franchise League, uh, and that was formed at Emmeline Pankhurst's house at Russell Square when she lived in London at that time. And I say that was even much more of a political group and only sought the vote for women. And I say none of these other things like trade unions. Uh, but uh, I say, uh, they also were very left leaning and did so support uh, divorce, uh, div uh, again, the extension of divorce and also inheritance, because quite often uh, the elder, um, the eldest of a, of, a, of a wealthy family might have been a daughter. They would have been overlooked for the eldest son. And so they were saying, why should it be the eldest son? You know, and it should be the eldest member of that family as well. This was then renamed the uh, this league uh, to be Sheffield. Uh, or, sorry, this led to the renaming uh, of the sort of that Sheffield uh, Association uh, to reflect part of that time. Now it was the Sheffield Women's Suffrage Society, and in 1897 they became a member of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. That's the NUWSS. Other societies uh, had their own. And uh, I could say there were uh, one was formed in York on 22nd of March 1889, the York Women's Suffrage Society, uh, that had links with the York Women's Liberal Association. So they're sort of uh, uh, linking these politics together. And of course, see there the Weavers Union, the sort of the trade union movements that were coming through in the 1880s, although they were quite often banned at that time. So let's go to one of these uh, ladies who was involved in this, and this was uh, Isabella Ford. Uh, she was born the 23rd of May 1855 in Headingley, uh, just outside of Leeds. She was the youngest of eight children of Quakers Robert Lawson Ford and Hannah uh, the Peace. Uh, her father was a solicitor who ran a local night school for mill girls. When she was 16, she began teaching at her father's school. In the 1880s, Isabella became involved with trade unions. Uh, she worked with tailoresses who were campaigning for better working conditions. She helped them to form a trade union and was all involved in them when they went on strike in 1889. Between sort of 1890 and 91, she marched with workers from Manning and Mills, Bradford, and they say as a revolt. Uh, a result of her involvement, she was elected a life member of the Leeds Trade and Labour Council. She also helped uh, found the Leeds Independent Labour Party and was also president of the Leeds Tayloresses Union. 
I say she was much more concerned with trade union organization and I say socialism second and female suffrage uh, third. She was no great orator by uh, all accounts, but uh, and wrote a great deal of pamphlets. And I say as part of her local work, she was elected onto the Independent Labour Party's National Administrative Council. In 1903, she was the first woman to speak at the annual conference of the Labour Representation Committee. That was later the, or, or at that time turning into the Labour Party. Sylvia Pankhurst, the daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, described Ford as a plain middle-aged woman with a red face and turban hat crushed down upon her straight hair whose nature yet seemed to me kindlier and more profound than that of her younger antagonist. She lived from the age of 10. Here, uh, this picture here is Adel Grange in Leeds, just off the, off the Ring Road. And in uh, 1922, uh, I guess she lived uh, I guess until she, she was uh, uh, until age 67 uh, there, and then moved to Adel Willows, where she died in 1924 age 69. So here she was working sort of politically with the trade unions, which is very well known at the time. There's a blue plaque on that uh, property. It's now a uh, retirement home down there, but the blue plaque is just there and basically says what I've just uh, told you, but I wanted to show the type of property she was living in. It wasn't a, a terrace street or anything like that. So she again came from a wealthy family. I've mentioned the Independent Labour Party a couple of times there. It was formed on the 13th of January 1893, uh, the very first in this country. And this was a result of that strike at Manningham Mills, uh, which I uh, just mentioned. The workers had become disillusioned there with the Liberals because they wouldn't uh, they deemed that the Tories or the Conservatives, uh, there were the class of the mill owners and the Liberals, uh, again, were the uh, class of the rest of the country. Uh, but because they, because they, a lot of those men didn't have the right to to vote still, and uh, therefore were looking to agitate for for something uh, that would represent uh, re represent them as well. And really, that sort of paternal instinct of the uh, mill owners at that time, when we looked at sort of Titus Salt and uh, uh, and uh, the Crossley family and other people like that, who built arms houses, they built churches, they built uh, housing for workers and things like that. Really, they'd either died or they'd moved off out to the suburbs. They no longer lived with them as as well. And you say uh, the building of the railways allowed them to travel from further afield, and so they became much more remote. Uh, from their workers at that time. So these workers that sort of broke away uh, were largely those who could vote for the Liberal Party. They weren't, uh, you say, why it was set up was for that very reason. They were disillusioned uh, with what they thought that Liberals would represent to them. And that really continues on right through to uh, with Asquith uh, being the Prime Minister as well. This disillusionment with them saying yes, 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 uh, and then finally when it came to the crunch uh, into acts, bills turned into acts, is that they didn't, they lacked support. And like I say, that's really, was really the sort of the coming of the end, really, of the Liberal parties uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And what we see is the rise of the, what became the Labour Party out of here. So some of these uh, workers from uh, Manning and Mills broke away, those who were allowed to vote, uh, and established the Independent Labour Party uh, in Bradford. And I guess they were agitating for reforms, uh, and not just for themselves, but uh, they suggested that, uh, as we see on that poster there, which is on the side of Little Germany, uh, near the Bradford Playhouse, uh, where it was really sort of established in that area around there. And uh, so they started start, start providing clubs and societies where the people of a similar mind uh, could meet. But by the sort of World War I, uh, the Labour Party had been established and the Independent Labour Party, I guess because of more grassroots, were, were seen largely as a bit of an anachronism and the Labour Party, I guess they really had come established in 1900. But that was the important thing is that it was established really in, in, in Bradford, I guess, and again, with the textile workers as part of that. So what was happening on the national stage again uh, was the uh, um, the founding of the National Unions of Women's sub, uh, Suffrage. Uh, again, these all these sort of 
national organisations, uh, I guess they, uh, I guess were floundering a bit at this time, and it wanted some, I guess, some oomph bit behind it. Uh, and in 1897, this was founded by Millicent Fawcett, uh, that lady over there, and uh, she was born 1847 and died in 1929. And what was her problem was, is that, um, as we'll see, is that she believed in peaceful protest. She felt that any violence or trouble uh, would persuade men that women couldn't be uh, trusted and given the right to vote. Her game plan was patience and logical arguments. Uh, she argued that women could hold responsible posts in society such as those women at that time sitting on school boards. Uh, and uh, she argued that if Parliament made laws and that uh, women had to obey these laws, then women should be part of the process uh, and uh, of making those laws. And she argued that as a woman, she paid the same tax as men uh, and they should have the same rights as men as well. <laughs> and that some of those uh, women were also wa wealthy uh, people as well. They had large manors and estates to run. They implied gardeners, workmen and labourers who could vote, uh, or some of them could, uh, but women couldn't, even though she employed them, uh, regardless of her wealth. So that was the National Union of Women's Suffrage, which was around for quite a while as well. And uh, the other one that was set up in this time uh, was a much more political organisation, uh, who were generally known as the suffragettes. And uh, say, uh, they were worried why this happened is that uh, because Millicent Fawcett's progress was so very, very slow. And uh, so... Uh, some of these uh, people, had, women, had supported the independent Labour uh, Party as well. And uh, this sort of uh, led to another a splintering as well. So, but really at the end of the uh, 19th century, we had really two political uh, sort of uh, suffragette parties. There was the National Union of Women's Suffrage, uh, which was the, uh, I guess that was a peaceful protest, uh, and the much more political, uh, hard-lined uh, one uh, called the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union. And this was founded by Emmeline Pankhurst in 1903. Uh, she was then aged 45 and involved her daughters Christabel, then aged 23, and Sylvia, then aged 21. Uh, in uh, Yorkshire, as we'll find, find out, is that it was her third daughter uh, that was represented here, the one that sort of uh, later on was bundled off to Australia in 1914, and is very little talked about, uh, but she was the main pankers, as we'll see later on uh, in, in Yorkshire. So who were the Pankhurst? Because this is because they made the uh, whole suffragette movement move forward, especially in uh, sort of from 1908 uh, to become increasingly militant, uh, especially uh, from 1910 to the outbreak of World War I. So uh, Emmeline Golden, as she was first known, was born in 1858 because she died uh, in 1928. She was born on Moss Sides, so that's a really the rougher side of Manchester and still is uh, today, and the eldest daughter of 10 children. Like I said, she had been influenced by her father, who was at the Peterloo Massacre uh, round there as well, again, when people were, were killed as part of that uh, uh, protest uh, movement round there. And uh, he was also on the local board at Salford, moving from Moss Side to Salford, probably nothing more than half a mile or a mile uh, uh, across this invisible boundary between the uh, two cities. And uh, her or mother also bought the Women's Suffrage Journal magazine as well. She met barrister Richard Pankhurst in 1878. That was a chap who had mentioned earlier. And he was a liberal and advocate of women's rights. She was 20 at the time and he was 44. They married the following year. They had five children, Christabel, born in 1880, died in 1958. Sylvia, born in 1882, died in 1960. Frank uh, was the first son. He was born 1884, but died in 1888 of diphtheria. <laughs> Adela, who we'll hear a lot more about, was born in 1885, and the last was Henry, born in 1889. 
despite coming from Moss Side uh, and moving to Salford, actually came from a, a, a rich family. Uh, they employed a butler and staff so that Emmeline had time for her campaigning work. They moved to London in early 1889 uh, to be nearer Westminster, the core of the action, but they returned to Manchester in 19, 1893. Maybe possibly because they thought they could create bigger waves up in the north than down in uh, in, in London, uh, where they really hadn't, couldn't make a name for themselves, perhaps. perhaps. I could say things were happening up here, like the founding of the Independent Labour Party as well. She was elected a poor law gar guardian for Chalton on Medlock, which is again adjacent to uh, to Salford, uh, and Gassay was then able to see the conditions inside a workhouse. I guess that's probably why she wanted to be elected to one of these uh, smaller boards or around. She said, I found that there were pregnant women in that workhouse scrubbing floors, doing the hardest kind of work, almost until their babies came into the world. Of course, the babies are very badly protected. These poor, unprotected mothers and their babies, I am sure, were potent factors in my education as a militant. So that's uh, where, how it came about. This is where we see, uh, so I've just mentioned, that's Emmeline, and that is Christabel, her, uh, her eldest daughter. Unfortunately, in 1898, Richard died of a gastric ulcer, uh, whilst Emmeline had to uh, say, uh, uh, whilst she was actually away, she'd taken Christabel to uh, Switzerland as she'd been unwell and unusually read about Richard's death in a newspaper on her way back. Uh, he had uh, sent her a telegram uh, asking her to come home, saying that he was unwell, probably uh, not quite stating that he was on death's door on that uh, telegram. So with a loss of income and maybe to get uh, another uh, further insight to the uh, to the working conditions of female. And that's the, the problem uh, really about sort of the, the Pankers and these other people is that they never really worked uh, as such. They didn't uh, work in mills or anything like that. So they didn't know a great deal about the conditions and uh, uh, and and where they, where they lived. And so that's why they tried to get closer to it. So now she became uh, the registrar of births, marriages and deaths in Charlton. Uh, uh, I guess they gave her, uh, again, an additional insight to those women coming in to register births so she could talk to them about it. And I guess they, she was sort of, uh, uh, that she really got fed up, I guess, with the sort of women's rights group of sort of failing at every hurdle and not doing anything. And she decided that uh, uh, by forming her own uh, political party or uh, her own uh, women's agitation uh, group, is that the way forward was direct action. So a bit more uh, on this. I think she's here with, uh, that's Christabel again, that's Emmeline. That possibly could be Sylvia, but I've not really seen a photograph of it. It seems like that Christabel uh, played a, a, a large support to her mother. And so these women uh, wanted to have the right to vote, but they weren't prepared to wait. And on 10th of October 1903, because she formed the Women's Social and Political Union. This is a, a group that largely became known as the suffragettes. And they say uh, it sort of encompasses all sort of groups that were around at the time, even the less radical ones as well. And they uh, say wanted direct action to get what they wanted. So to, uh, I could say, to agitate more, the three of them travelled the length and breadth of the country uh, to stir things up. In 1905, Emmeline rolled up at the Hunslet Mechanics Institute. It's uh, no longer there. Uh, it was demolished and replaced with the very bright uh, red uh, public library, uh, which was built, I think, 1906 or something like that. Uh, and you could say, inspired several young Leeds women uh, uh, to uh, join that as well, including Louise Swales, who went on to lead a lifelong uh, of campaigning in the North. She also came down the Cone Valley as well and to Sheffield uh, and uh, say she attracted a huge crowd around uh, the town hall steps as well and say attacking the government and the brutal treatment of suffragettes that was emerging at that time. Uh, 
But it was Emmeline's other daughter, uh, Adela, because in 1905 she was aged 20, who was organiser of the uh, Women's Social and Political Union in Yorkshire. Indeed, she moved from Manchester or Salford uh, to live in Sheffield on Marlborough Road in the leafy suburb of Brown, uh, Broom Hill, which it still is today. Uh, they even opened a suffragette shop in Chapel Walk, right in the city centre in 1908, selling merchandise, holding classes and producing campaign materials. She too stood uh, in the steps of her mother on the town hall uh, after attempting to storm the Cutler's Feast. Uh, from here, she spoke of the inequalities of social society's wrongs against women uh, between uh, before rioting broke out between the police and the 900 strong crowd. The rioting was usually the result of men infiltrating these, uh, these meetings or rallies. Uh, not so they weren't allowed to go to them because many men supported women's rights, but there's also that, that unruly element that, uh, and like I say, even amongst other females as well, who didn't support the suffragette movement. They didn't really, I guess, want the vote. They weren't interested, they weren't bothered in it as well. And these were really sort of men who came in here perhaps to create upset. They would stone throw, uh, they would shout during speeches and generally try to annoy the crowd. Other WSPU groups opened in Halifax in January 1907. That was founded by a Mary Gorforth. Uh, she was born uh, in uh, 1881 in Leeds and died in New York in 1973. She was living in Bramley, uh, Leeds, at, uh, at, at, for some time between 1905 to 1907, and went on to help establish 17 of these local WSPU uh, groups. She was dubbed a Merry Militant State, and indeed in October, the year before, she had been arrested at the House of Commons and imprisoned in Holloway for two months. She was also at the centre of demonstrations in 1907 and again in a riot on polling day in Southport in 1910. She's also co-editor of a magazine called The Free Woman and Gassave, who published articles on sexuality, morality and marriage and urged tolerance of male homosexuality. So she was a, a, a truly liberated lady uh, and she emigrated to New York in 1916 and never returned. Like I say, a lot of these leaders actually did uh, leave uh, at the start of World War One uh, to different places. And we'll see uh, largely Australia, many went, uh, many went to. And uh, so we'll see that with the WSPU, people thought they were being too militant. And so some members broke away in 1907 to form the Women's Freedom League, including uh, uh, a lady called Edith Howe Martin. She was born in London in 1875 and died in Sydney, Australia in 1954. She was one of the first sub, uh, suffragettes to be arrested in October 1906 when she broke into the lobby of the House of Commons and got a two months prison sentence. In September 1907, she along uh, with others resigned from the WSPU because of the dominance of Mrs. Pankhurst and they wanted non-violent illegal acts. And she came up to York to convince the York meeting of the former York Women's Suffrage Society, uh, now part of the WSPU, to join the Women's Freedom League. Uh, although she, uh, Edith, resigned in 1912, uh, largely because the WFL found it is that membership was dying off, they were had made few inroads uh, and that they were overshadowed by the WSPU as well, the really the suffragettes. And that's what really happened to a lot of these is that the, it was the suffragettes that took the headlines, it was the suffragettes uh, that were leading action from the front and were getting noticed and which then uh, I guess they tarred every other organisation with a, uh, the same brush as being of direct action in, into these things. So, um, can say the, can say, but the suffragette movement actually uh, in 1903 set off relatively peaceful uh, and it, can say it was the uh, 1905 that the organisation cre uh, created a stir when Christabel Pankhurst and Annie Kenny interrupted a political meeting in Manchester to ask two liberal politicians, that's Winston Kurt Churchill and Sir Edward Grey, if they believe women should have the right to vote. 
neither man replied. As a result, the two women got out a banner which had on it votes for women and shouted at the two politicians to answer their questions. Because see, such uh, things never happened in these political meetings. People sat down and were quiet and listened to speakers. And again, there's still, uh, I think, that, I guess that happens today when we see sometimes uh, political rallies or speeches being interrupted by people uh, because it's not considered uh, say, polite uh, to do so. But that was probably the only way that they could get here. They were free, thrown out of the meeting and arrested for, cons uh, for causing an obstruction and a technical assault on a police officer. But it wasn't easy because they'd been called a suffragette. Hannah Mitchell, uh, I guess, a, 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 and, uh, and, and I want to remember this, the, of the political union said, no cause can be won between dinner and tea. And most of us who were married had to work with one hand tied behind us. Now, say most of these uh, organizers were either middle class or upper class, as many of their family, uh, families supported them uh, as well. But they really had little to lose, unlike the working class women, uh, who were often the main breadwinners in the family. Uh, they could lose their jobs. They still had their children to look after, homes to run, and I guess. Uh, men uh, to look after as well. And also they couldn't really afford to lose the respectability uh, that happened in those days when they lived uh, on a street and everybody knew, everybody knew each other's business as well. And they found that uh, if, if they uh, were part of this, got arrested, then it wasn't really the risk of, uh, uh, of being imprisoned and lo really losing the whole of their lives around it. So it was really, if there were suffragettes, there was a, it was really a clandestine thing that they would do uh, either in work or between work and, and, and home. So we'll look at a, another lady here called uh, Mary Gawthorpe. Uh, she was uh, born in Leeds uh, in uh, Melville Street in Meanwood, just off the city centre. She came, went on to become a teacher until 1906, when she became a full-time paid organiser for the WSPU in Leeds when the branch had opened there. You can say this time she was living in Bramley until 1907. That's where the plaque is on the wall uh, in Bramley on the house that she lived in. Uh, she is a, a, a terrace street uh, adjacent to the park. So it still stands there as well on the Nine Worrells Mount uh, where she lived. She came into the suffragette movement via, via the Leeds Art Club. That was in the Leeds city centre. Uh, and they also, the Fabian Society, that's a sort of democratic socialism via peaceful means met. And the Theosophic Society, that was founded in 1875 to discuss worldwide religious philosophies. And it was really the mixing of the ideas, which she said brought a new art reality into consciousness. Uh, quite something to say at that time, and even now, who knows what it means. Uh, but I guess it was mixing of the art world and, and politics together uh, that set her off on the course of becoming a suffragette. Because uh, she was an effective uh, public speaker, came involved in the trade unions, was also a member of the Independent Labour Party. Because after meeting Christabel Pankhurst, she was quickly appointed as a national organiser for the WSPU and campaigned in Wales. Oddly, uh, coming from Leeds, that she could speak fluent Welsh, so who knows where she got that from. Uh, she established the WSPU office in Leicester. I guess say she too was imprisoned in October 1906, again, were part of those protesters outside of the Houses of Parliament, uh, but got uh, uh, in, off in, when a violent scrum, I guess, between uh, police, sometimes men and women. And I guess say she said she was badly knocked about and could not appear in court. So I guess she might have been arrested. I'll just finish on this last one here for today, and this was really the sort of the uh, one of the larger rallies that was held uh, here. Because say in the uh, this took place uh, up on Shipley Glen, uh, right above uh, Salt's Mill at Salt Air, uh, and say the sort of the campaign 
uh, was in full swing. This is a uh, from a newspaper. This is from the Wharfdale Observer. The two articles, well, it's, uh, it's uh, these two photographs, which are part of a, a longer article. If you're going to look into them, it sort of says how many people came up to it. They say sixty thousand. Other reports have increased that to a hundred thousand. Uh, and it talks about them, uh, the speakers, and uh, who they are down here. You've got Mrs. Pankhurst, Adela Pankhurst. Uh, they are. We've got Mary Gorthorpe down there as as well and some of those people involved in that so in an article in the votes for women uh, paper on the 4th of june 1908 it said our campaign is now in full swing in hull sheffield york and Dun and doncaster although we have not had as yet uh, held any meetings in the two latter places as neither doncaster or york have ever been visited by a union there uh, there is a great deal of work to be done miss dugdale is going to help me in york and we must have hold some dinner hour meetings there amongst Roundtree's girls, as I believe they employ about 3,000 women and girls in their chocolate and cocoa works. The Yorkshire Evening Press reported that Mrs. Martell, uh, this is Nellie Martell, uh, 1855 to 1940, who until actually 1904 lived in Australia and only a member of the WPSU uh, until this year, so just for a, a couple of years, was the principal speaker at the uh, meeting the previous night in the De Grey Rooms opposite the art gallery, and which the newspaper mistakenly thought had been organised by the newly for formed York branch of the WSPU. Uh, Una Dugdale, 18, born 1879, she was a daughter of a uh, naval commander. She died in London in 1975. Uh, when she married uh, the uh, 1912, uh, she refused to say the word obey to her husband. And that carried out quite a furore and uh, was carried in a lot of the newspapers of that time. She told the meeting there, that's at the De Grey Rooms, uh, that their militant uh, action during the last two years had done more than 50 years of quiet and dignified persuasion. This was to be their supreme effort. It was to be a fight to the finish, and she did not think it would be long before women obtained the vote. She needed uh, a foresight there for another 25 years. Mrs. Pankhurst came, also came to York and addressed another meeting at the Degay Rooms on the 15th of June that year. So they targeted York here, because I think they realised so many women worked in the chocolate factories around there. And uh, could say, really to drum up support for a, a demonstration that was going to take place in Hyde Park on the 21st of June 1908 and dubbed Women's Sunday. And in the evening, she and Mrs. Martell addressed an open air meeting in Exhibition Square. But like I guess it seems though she didn't really get much support in York as in that evening when only a hundred people turned up. I guess they were expecting probably a thousand or more. But really uh, what it was uh, is to get people from Yorkshire down to this uh, meeting in, 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 in London. And the cost of it from York to London was 11 shillings return, because it equivalent to a half week's wage for some of these girls. And that 11 shillings, that was even at a reduced rate because the railway companies were laying on special trains and they could probably guarantee they could get three or four hundred people from York on a train down there as well. And Mrs. Pankhurst asked, will a few of our wealthy sympathisers in York help to send the poorer sisters to take part in this great historic demonstration? You say that sort of a rally uh, that she had uh, down in London saw uh, no ar arrests at all. Uh, but it seems that it stirred things up uh, a bit and uh, she was back in York again uh, later on in the uh, in the year, 28th of July. She addressed a very large crowd this time in St. Sampson Square. So perhaps that rally, which I'll report on a little later on, uh, on, on Wednesday, stirred things up a bit nationally because it had been reported in all the paper and was probably the gossip at the time because even that rally in Hyde Park had been attended by Thomas Hardy. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, of, of course, and H.G. Wells went uh, uh, there as well. And it was said at the time, from first to last, it was a great meeting, daringly conceived, splendidly stage managed and successfully carried out. Hyde Park has probably never seen a greater crowd of people, said the Evening Standard. So this was really before the sort of violence that uh, happened really in the, in the following years. And uh, so that uh, 
a lot more people came to hear her uh, in York as well. And uh, they were sort of signing petitions at this time as well and uh, trying to get sort of MPs on the side to take these uh, petitions into, um, into the Houses of, uh, of Parliament. Uh, but they were always rebuffed. Uh, nothing ever came of these petitions. And they found, Miss Banker said, there was no alternative but to adopt militant tactics. Uh, tactics. She added amid applause, you will never hear the last of us. We mean to pester them in every possible way until we get what we want. They say the first uh, militant actions took place uh, really that year. Jenny Baines was found guilty of organising an unlawful assembly during a visit to Leeds by, when uh, attended by Prime Minister uh, Herbert Asquith. She was sentenced to six months imprisonment at Armley Jail. On the day of her release, a kite was flown above the prison walls emblazoned with votes for women. Things didn't go as well when uh, Adela Pankhurst addressed an open air meeting at, in Skipton High Street in the summer of 1908, when she was heckled by men throwing flour. Every word was greeted with a derisive cheer, comic songs and the din of penny rattles, reported the Craven Herald. And continued, Miss Pankhurst took no notice. All she was concerned about was getting her message home, again they reported, and then she went on a tour of Dale's villages, including Grassington. So I'll stop there uh, today.